Hello, I'm Richard and with the help of the Runtime Text Development Team we'd like to demonstrate some of the labeling abilities available in ArcGIS Runtime. I'll begin with an overview of labeling before we dive into the details. What are labels? How do they differ from annotation or other text graphics? Labels are text information displayed on the map or scene but they are created dynamically on the fly based on the feature attributes. This is analogous to symbology being created and positioned for features based on their shape geometry attribute. Labels are positioned on or near their feature, according to the author's preferences, but can also dynamically move to avoid overlapping other labels or important features. The instructions for how to create each label and what the position preferences are are described in a label definition. One or more label definitions can be attached to each layer of features. Currently, label definitions are supported for feature layers, graphics overlays, ArcGIS map image sublayers, and subtype sublayers. The labels are created purely for the display and are not written to a database or file. Labels are continuously updated on the view as the application zooms, pans, or rotates, and new features come into view or more space becomes available for lower priority labels that couldn't previously fit onto the display. Changes to individual features can also trigger updates to label contents and positions, whether it is the features position changing or the features attributes which drive the label text. But where do label definitions come from? If maps and layers have been authored in ArcGIS Pro or ArcGIS Online, then the feature classes may have been given one or more label classes each, and can be published to mobile map packages or online services. These can then be read by runtime applications, which internally convert them to label definitions. Label definitions prioritize the most used settings and optimize the appearance and behavior for mobile devices. The appearance and placement of labels will not be identical to the authoring environment. The streamlined runtime label placement engine simplifies the placement algorithms and doesn't support all the desktop preferences. This allows runtime labels to individually respond in real time to changes to the view or feature, and the labels stay still unless they need to change, reducing distraction on the display. But label definitions do not have to be created by other applications. Runtime developers can create, edit, or remove label definitions from layers using the Runtime SDK label definition classes and functions. One detail of map specification that is very important for labeling is the reference scale. Many published maps specify a reference scale to give the experience of a paper map. This means that the symbols and text will draw at their design size when viewed at that reference scale and as the user zooms in or out, the text changes size on the screen, so that it always covers the same amount of the map. If the map has no reference scale, that is if the reference scale is set to zero, then the symbols and text will stay the same size on the screen. This allows the text to always be readable by only showing the label when there is room to place it. If the map does have a reference scale, individual layers symbols and labels can still choose to use it or not. In this example the parcel edge measurements are honoring the reference scale while the polygon identity text is not scaling with the map. Now we'll look at parts of runtime labeling in more depth. I'll hand you over to Chris to explain the label definition properties in more detail. Thanks Richard. Hi, my name is Chris, um, and today we're going to be taking a deeper dive into 2D labeling. Now we can see how we can get labels into our runtime application, but how can we coerce those labels into something that we think is presentable? And we can do that by using a label definition. So just to recap, what is a label definition? Well, it's a series of rules or what we call properties that are attached to our operational layer. So that's feature layer, graphic overlay, ArcGIS map image sublayer, subtype sublayer. So a map has operational layers, and each operational layer has label definitions. And a label definition is composed of these properties or rules. Now we can interface with these label definitions by using a JSON descriptor or scheduled for update 100.11 
the new labeling API. Now in this presentation, we'll be focusing on JSON. So let's go and take a look at an example. Okay, so here's a map with our favorite data. Um, Peter has graciously put this application together for me and allows me to set the layers and edit the label definitions via JSON on them. So the first thing that kind of stands out to me here is that it's actually quite difficult to read this label down here on this polygon feature. Um, so what I want to do is I want to get into the symbol on that label definition and make it a little bit bigger, maybe change its color. Um, so first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the layer and we have our JSON here. This is the minimum amount of JSON that we require for this example. So we have our symbol with our color and we have our font. These are the only things that I think we only need for this. So maybe we can make it bigger. So just change the size to 32. I'm going to hit apply. Still a little bit harder to read. So I just change the color. It's quite simply, let's make it white. And there we are. Really quick and easy, a bit of JSON description, and we've got our label bigger and got a little bit more colorful. Now let's go and look at a slightly more trickier example. So we've got some trees here, at least I think they're trees. Um, and there's a couple of things here that I want to change. Okay, so I think some more labels can be placed here. It's using static deconfliction, um, which only attempts to place labels at their preferred position. So let's change it to dynamic. And now the labels are allowed to be moved from their tried position to attempt to place them on the map. The second thing that I want to do is to clearly define that these point features are in fact trees. So I'm just going to update the expression here in the labeling definition to have trees as a postfix. And let's apply that. Great. Okay. Now I know the trees for real. However, now they're a little bit too long and probably I want to stack them up. So let's do that. Let's change stack labeling and turn it on. And here we've got our stack labeling, but there looks like there's a bit of a problem here. So these labels are stacking. However, these chestnuts, these sweet chestnut trees are not stacking. Oh, so this string contains white space characters, um, backslash T or backslash N. So if that is hidden away in the string, we assume that the user know what they're doing um, and we don't treat um, line breaks. Okay, so you're attached to this data and you can't reauthor it. So how can we get around these white spaces and these strings? Well, we can use the labeling definition and manipulate its expression in order to do so. So here in our expression, all we need to do is now add a replace and we can replace the tabs with nothing. So now if I update that, great. Now the stacking is working on all our trees. Now let's have a look at how we achieve this practically in code. And it's quite easy, really. All we need to do is create a new label definition and we're creating it from JSON. So we call from JSON method. We are passing in our JSON string here. And in this case, it's the one we were writing in the application directly. All we need to do then is set the label definition into the feature layer we are working on. And in this case, it's index zero because we are replacing the label definition instead of adding one. Now it's important to remember that the label definition is immutable. So a copy would first have to be assigned before making changes and pushing it back into the label definition. Okay. So now let's take a look at all the label properties that we're currently supporting and we can group them by their feature types that they are affected on. So we got all features, point features, line features, polygon features, line and polygon features and line and point features. So all of these uh, label definition properties are um, documented at developers.arcgis.com. But please note that sometimes we're using the old name for a label definition, which is labeling info, but they are in fact the same.
Okay, let's get started with deconfliction properties. So deconfliction strategy, as we saw earlier, setting the deconfliction strategy to dynamic will move labels from its preferred position around its feature until it can find a place that does not conflict with other labels. Um, allow overlap of label. So quite simply, this will allow other labels to overlap this one being set during deconfliction. Priority, which labels to be placed first and also preferred when deconflicting. These labels are effectively processed first. So this is set by numerical value. Um, the lower value to zero, the more valuable the label definition is considered. So think of it as a queue where priority one is processed before priority two and before priority three and etc. Remove duplicates, removing labels with the same text. It, it effectively reduces the clash on the screen um, if the features can be amalgamated. It's quite handy when labeling wrote. Okay, so let's move on to expression properties. As we've seen before, um, and as Richard will go into more detail later, it's a string that defines how to build a label's text. Use coded values. This is a bit more advanced and only works on simple expressions. It translates the main identifier into meanings. Uh, name. It's only identifier or ID tag only for the label definition. It's, it's quite handy for interfaces where you might be dealing with a lot of uh, label definitions and you want to discriminate between them. Where, so this is a query to decide which features should have their labels calculated. Richard will also go into this in more detail later as well. Okay, so label placement properties. Um, so label placement is a preferred position of the label around its feature. As we saw earlier, um, if the deconfliction is set to dynamic, then the label may move from this preferred position. Preferred position. So just be just be aware of that. Text layout: how the text is aligned at its position. Ideally, uh, use this in conjunction with the symbol properties to get the best results. Text orientation: um, does the text stay upright to its feature or to the screen? So consider when rotating the map, or, or if you desire the text to always be on a specific side of the feature, you can use this property to, uh, to get that behavior. Okay, so now scale properties. Allow overrun. If the label cannot fit within the feature, we can still present the label if we set this to true. So as we can see here, our overrun is set to true, um, and the label is allowed to be placed even though the feature is actually quite smaller than the text. Max scale, the visibility when the current scale is smaller than the max scale. This is coupled with the min scale, um, which is the visibility when the current scale is larger than the max scale. So if the current scale is between these two values, then yes, please attempt to place my label. Um, it's quite handy when you want to create like a level of detail. Maybe you want to reveal lesser towns, for example, when you're zoomed further into the map. Okay, stacking properties, stack label. Uh, this is an on off flag to enable or disable um, stacking on labels. So it's going to basically affect all the other properties here in stacking. Stack alignment, so you can push the stacking alignment to the left or to the center or to the right. Um, but dynamic allows it to change the alignment depending on its position relative to the feature. Stack break position. So when you decided to break a row, at what part should this happen? Before the word, maybe at the end, halfway through, you can set this here. Stack row length. The maximum length of the row before you want to break it. St stack separators. So this is the character to use when you want to break the row. Uh, in this case, we're using an at symbol, um, but the default separator is actually a white space. Okay, so moving on to symbol properties. So these are a bunch of presentational properties here that can be set. I'm not going to go into detail, um, but I, I should say that the angle and the offset um, should not be used. They're legacy properties, um, and they've been around since before we've had a labeling engine, so don't use them. 
Right, let's kind of move on to polygon-only properties. So allow overlap of feature boundary. How far you want your labels to be placed um, within to the, the polygon feature edge. Um, and this is similar to allow overlap of feature interior, which is how far labels are allowed to be placed into the polygons features interior. We're working on improving the edge cases for the avoid value at the moment um, because they're not producing the ideal results. Okay, so just point feature properties, label angle info. So this describes how to position a label in relation to the label's position. Um, so we can combine this with text layout to create a radial or tangential labels, which is ideal for technical maps. Um, label angle info is an arcade expression. So it's orientational angle is driven by its feature um, or label. Right, just line properties now. Um, Line connection. Should matching labels or end vertices be joined or shared? And repeat label, um, which is where multiple copies of the label is placed along the line. Um, we're looking in the future to allow this for polygons as well. And repeat label distance, which is the distance at which repeating labels are placed on the line. It's not 100% accurate, so it's not ideal for solutions where distance between labels is important, like mile markers. It would be better to have them as part of the feature in that case. So lines and polygons, multi-part. How many labels should be placed on the multi-part features? So if you consider Canada with its too many islands, maybe we want to produce some of the clutter. Um, we can limit this by using multi-part. And finally, um, for lines and point properties, we've just got offset distance, which is simply how far the label is to be placed offset from the feature. Oy. Right, well, as I hinted at earlier, we're planning a new labeling API for update 100.11. And we're looking for one-to-one -one functionality with the existing JSON interface to label definitions. The idea is that both interfaces will work alongside each other. So this means that existing workflows will continue to work, but now there'll be a more faster and a friendlier alternative uh, interface to work with your label definitions. So as a quick teaser, Let's take a look at this in a simple example. Okay, so this is a very simple example of using the labeling API. Peter's built me an application here with a button called label placement. And this label placement button here fires a call to the labeling API to change the position of the label around this point. Peter has coded it to randomly place the label around the point. Okay, so how are we interfacing with the new labeling API? And again, it's quite simple, really. All we're doing is we're getting our label definition collection from the feature layer. In this case, we want index zero. Um, then all we need to do is call the set placement method on our label definition. And we're passing in our labeling placement enum with a value of point below center. Now, unlike the JSON um, interface, which is immutable, the new labeling API is mutable. So it means that you don't need to push that label definition back into your collection on your feature layer, and it makes things a lot more easier to work with. Okay, well, thank you very much for enjoying these slides um, on how you can use a label definition to wrangle the presentation of your labels in 2D. Now, Alexander is going to take you one dimension higher. Thanks, Chris. Hello, everyone. I'm Alexander, and today I'm going to be giving you a short run through of runtime cores support for labeling within 3D scenes. 3D labels are a recent addition to runtime core, having only been officially supported as of release 100.10. However, a considerable amount of functionality associated with 3D labels has already been implemented. 3D labels can be generated for features that come from web scenes, mobile scene packages, and of course, you can label graphic overlay features created using Runtime Core as well. Just a quick note about the mobile scene packages. Um, as of one uh, release 100.10, that excludes 3D points. Um, so labeling support for those will come in a subsequent release. 2D points are still supported. These labels 
are defined using the exact same label definitions as you would use for 2D labeling. So there's no need to transform your label properties from a 2D format to a 3D one or vice versa. It's all the same. Note that some labeling properties are not yet supported for 3D. Now these will be coming in the future. For now, if an unsupported label property is used in 3D, runtime will just ignore it. So it's still safe to use these properties. We'll go into a bit more detail about the supported and unsupported properties near the end. The workflow for labeling within a 3D scene is as straightforward as it is for labeling in a 2D map. Label definitions are created or loaded and applied to a feature layer in a manner identical to the 2D use case. The feature layer is set onto a scene object in the same way that you would for a map object. After this, Runtime Core will create and display labels within your scene using your specified properties. Just remember to always enable labeling on your layer and in your scene. We're going to take a quick break from the slides for a minute and have a look at a small example application utilizing Runtime's 3D labeling functionality. Before we do, I just want to point out that over half of all labeling properties available are supported in Runtime for 3D scenes. And many of those labeling properties have the exact same effect on your label's appearance as they would in a 2D map. With that in mind, for this demonstration, I'll be focusing on some of the ways in which 2D and 3D labeling differ. So here we have a simple 3D scene containing a collection of labeled features. This particular series of point features describes a cluster of trees near our office in Cardiff. I'm going to start by talking about the deconfliction strategy for 3D labeling. Unlike 2D labeling, there is currently only one deconfliction strategy. When performing this deconfliction strategy, runtime attempts to place all labels at their preferred location. But should any labels overlap, it determines the most important one for display and hides all other overlapping labels. In other words, it's what we would call a static deconfliction strategy because it doesn't attempt to dynamically reposition any labels. To determine which labels should be displayed, runtime first considers the value assigned to the priority labeling property. If the labels all have matching priorities, then the next stage in the strategy is to take into account the label's distance within the 3D scene to the camera. Labels with a higher priority are favored over those with a lesser priority and labels closer to the camera are favored over those which are further away. So let's see that in action. As you can see here, we have some labels that are separate when the camera is looking at them one way and overlap when the camera looks at them another way. You can see here that only the label closest to the camera is ever displayed in the overlapping case. The label that's further away fades out of existence with this nice little fade out animation. As we rotate the camera around, labels will pop back into visibility range, and so they will fade in. In addition to the deconfliction strategy, label visibility within a 3D scene can also be determined by setting the minimum and maximum scale ranges. Now these work in a very similar way to the way they do in 2D. However, there is a slight difference in meaning. In 3D, the min and max scale ranges are used internally to calculate a series of distance ranges, which are compared to the label's distance in the scene and the camera's distance in the scene. Just like in 2D, we can set the label placement property to change how labels are positioned with respect to their feature. And again, the exact same label placement properties are available to use in 3D for this purpose. It's important to note that in 3D, the label placement is relative to the features placement on screen rather than the features position in the 3D scene. For 2D labeling, it was not necessary to make this distinction as placing labels relative to the features position on a map or on the screen were the same. What this means in layman's terms is that no matter where I position my camera, labels that are above the feature will always be above it on screen. Labels that are placed below are always going to be below that feature on screen, and so on and so forth. You may have also noticed that all the labels within 3D labeling are drawn horizontally on screen. 
In future, Runtime Core will provide more functionality to customize 3D label orientations via the labeling properties. But as of release 100.10, 3D labels are always drawn horizontally on screen. Next, I'd like to talk about two scenarios that you would only find within a 3D scene. Let's start with extrusion. Users interacting with features in 3D scenes can extrude the top face of a feature. And now, labeling will maintain its position relative to the top of that extruded feature. So as you can see, we can alter the amount of extrusion and runtime call will always place the label towards the top of the feature. All extrusion modes are supported, and this is true for points, lines, and polygons. Next, underground labeling. 3D scenes allow users to explore and interact with features that are underground, and now these can be labeled too. For runtime 100.10, there's no difference to how underground labels are managed. They all use all of the same properties as above ground labels. From runtime 100.11, the key difference between labels placed above and below ground will be a matter of visibility. When the camera is placed above ground, you will not be able to see any labels placed below ground. And likewise, when the camera is placed underground, you will not be able to see any labels placed above ground. Again, I'd just like to reiterate that this will be coming as part of runtime 100.11. So that was just a quick demonstration of some of the new 3D labeling functionality provided in runtime core version 100.10. Again, I'd just like to reiterate that you can use the same label definitions for 2D maps and 3D scenes, and runtime core will interpret the property as appropriate for 3D labeling. There's a lot of functionality available. In fact, all 16 properties currently listed on this slide can be used to alter the display of your 3D labels today. And on this slide, we have a list of the other 12 label properties. Support for these in 3D scenes will be coming in the future. In fact, coming as soon as release 100.11, we'll be supporting the text layout and offset distance properties. As in 2D, the text layout property will allow users to orient their labels in ways other than always being horizontal on screen. A particular use case that stands out to me is the alignment of a 3D label to a 3D line feature, which is maintained regardless of the camera position. The offset distance property will work in the exact same way as it does in 2D, in that it provides a positional offset in screen space between your label and its feature. The direction of this offset will be determined by the label placement property. For points, this means that the offset will be in any direction around the feature on the screen. For lines, this means that the offset will be either above or below the line. And as in 2D, polygons will not utilize the offset distance property. At this point, you may be wondering what's coming up for the future of 3D labeling, besides support for more label properties. As, as I touched on in the demonstration, you can expect visibility enhancements for underground labeling to be introduced in runtime as soon as release 100.11. And looking a little bit further into the future, we'll be supporting the ability to label 3D points that have been loaded in from mobile scene packages as well. Thank you very much for watching. I'm now gonna hand you back over to Richard, who's gonna give you a short run through of recent developments with labeling expressions. Over to you, Richard. Thanks Alex, it's great to see labelling come into life in 3D scenes. Now I'd like to explain the different expression languages that can be used to select or change the content of your labels. They are all described using expression strings, but each has a different purpose or syntax. The SQL or SQL WHERE clause is common on many runtime objects. It is used to specify a subset of the rows in a dataset which we want to work with. The expression is a statement about the attribute values in a row that must be true if the row is to be included. Remember, a label definition is attached to a layer, such as a feature layer. The feature layer already has a definition expression, which is also a SQL WHERE clause used to specify which features from the table should be included in the feature layer. Each label definition then has its own SQL WHERE clause, which is used to specify a smaller set of rows within those used by the feature layer. 
If several label definitions are attached to a feature layer, then each label definition can describe a different subset. This can be used to choose just the most relevant features to have labels or to apply different labeling to different groups of features. It can be combined with scale ranges so that different label definitions are used to show different labels as the user zooms in. Let's have a quick look at this on some real data for the Isle of Wight. If we wanted to limit the town labels to just those with the population size recorded, then use SQL to check the population field of each row. Then we've reduced the number of labels without changing which towns are drawn. Similarly, if we're only interested in the main A roads, we could match against the road name or use a type field or use combined expressions. To select just the features that we're interested in labeling. The label expression on a label definition defines what text should be in the label for a feature. It is a formula applied to each feature to work out the text for that feature's label. There are three languages supported, arcade expressions, web map expressions and simple expressions, which could all do the simplest tasks such as picking out a single attribute value. The default and recommended language is Arcade, as it is powerful and fully portable between ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Pro and runtime applications. The other languages allow older maps to be labelled automatically in runtime applications. If the JSON definition of your label definition defines expressions in more than one language, then labelling will look for the Arcade expression first, or failing at the web map expression, before falling back to the simple expression. Full details, documentation and a playground for Arcade can be found on its own developers web page at developers.arcgis.com slash arcade. Arcade's use in labelling allows you to access all of the features, attributes and geometry. You can call on the large and growing library of text, geometry, mathematics and data functions and use branches and loop statements similar to JavaScript. Let's have a look at some examples. Returning to our Isle of Wight towns data, the current arcade expression for the towns is $feature.comment. $feature is the name for each feature as it is passed to the arcade expression. To retrieve an attribute, we can use its name directly as we did here, or to retrieve the object ID, or we can use a string lookup, which opens the possibilities of using script logic to decide which attribute to use. We could retrieve the complete geometry as a JSON string, but it's a little unwieldy, so we could pick out the parts we're interested in. Let's check what type of object the geometry is. And for a point, we can access its coordinates directly, which is probably still more precision than we want. So we can specify how to format the numbers using the text function. And if we want the name included again, we can concatenate them together naturally. This also shows the dynamic horizontal stacking alignment that runtime labeling supports. We can use other programming logic to decide our label. such as if statements, so that we can use attributes to drive what text we build, or loop statements, for example, we could use a simple expression that loops through the characters of the each label, removing the vowels. As our logic gets more complicated, or we want to repeat operations, we can introduce helper functions. Powerful language features allow you to simplify common operations. Instead of a list of if statements to categorize the size of population, we could use the when statement to write something like this, or to remove the smaller text towns altogether, 
could uncomment in another variation. Arrays and dictionaries can also be used to build more complex logic. For instance, you could build a simple translation function like this, which converts street into S, green into G, etc. Which has changed Thorley Street to Thorley S and Luckham Village to Luckham V. And so much more. I'll just quickly show you that you can use the other languages for simple concatenation, but it has very limited portability between applications. An older ArcGIS Online web text expression might use this format with the curly brackets for fields to combine attributes and fields. And the simple or rest expression language can also concatenate field names using its square bracket notation. One very powerful use of arcade expressions is to build text content that includes formatting tags. Formatting tags are similar to HTML tags and have long been supported in ArcGIS Pro. These allow us to customize the appearance, label by label, driven by the feature attributes. These tags need to be in the text string built from the label expression. It can come directly from the attribute or be built by the expression. Let's have a look at some examples. The feature attribute might already have the tags in the text. but it is more normal for the label expression to specify how to present the text. Each of these is still a single label, but with different formatting applied to different parts of the text. It's important to pair the tags, so it's useful to use a helper function to build the text. You can use attributes to choose what to format. For instance here, we want different colours for different sized towns. Other tags allow us to modify the size of some or all of the text. Or even change the font. Because it is a text string, there is less check-in or support. There are a couple of frequent gotchas. Be careful that your tag name is correct or it will be ignored. For instance, if I misspell the colour tag as COL, it is ignored. Or if I mismatch the case in, it is not recognised as formatting tags at all. And don't try to use the less than sign in your tagged text. Use the same escape code as HTML does. Now imagine the possibilities of using date fields to automatically make your labels larger, or to highlight colour, or optionally including support and information from other fields. There is so much you can already do, and in future releases, runtime labelling and annotation will support even more of the formatting tags that ArcGIS Pro allows for its labels. As we've seen, labeling has many aspects, both within runtime and when bringing in labels from other sources. It is a powerful tool that can add a lot of dynamic information to your data and allows a lot of flexible customization. Future releases will continue to add more of the labeling styles and strategies from ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online, while keeping runtime labeling fast and small enough for mobile applications. Thank you for listening. We hope you found these explanations useful and we look forward to your questions, comments and ideas. I'd like to thank Chris and Alex for helping explain some of the details of labelling and to thank Peter for building the sample applications. Hi everyone, I'm Richard and with my colleagues Chris, Alex and Peter, we develop uh, many of the runtime labeling and annotation components. We hope that you found that whistle-stop tour of runtime labeling useful. There was a lot of information on different topics crammed into 40 minutes. We have a few minutes available now to answer questions, explain anything, or discuss ideas.
you should be able to type questions into the Q&A box if you haven't been already. If you include your name in the question, we can follow up later. Um, or you can always go to the forum at community.esri.com uh, and look for the developers native libraries part. Uh, I can see we've got quite a few questions already in the queue. Um, the first one's uh, a straightforward one. Uh, I'll take that one. Um, the slides should be available to you already. I believe you should have a supplemental files tab um, on the session from which you should be able to download the PDF um, for those slides or for all the slides you've seen today. Uh, the next question we've got is asking about a replacement for the angle and offset XY inside the symbol. Uh, Peter, perhaps your best place to answer that one. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, so we are currently supporting the symbol angle and offset properties for legacy reasons. And the way those work, they are just added on top of the angle and offset expression respect, respectively. Uh, the symbol offset will offset everything in a single direction. We, we're not turning those old properties off, uh, those symbol properties off uh, in the future, but um, they are, there are label definition alternatives. We advise our uh, users uh, and developers to use the angle property on the label expression and the label definition offset exp expression respectively for these two as an alternative. When using the label definition offset expression, it will automatically do the offsetting in the correct direction and the direction will be dependent on the label placement type. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think probably got another one for you as well. Uh, is there a way to programmatically get the value that an arcade expression um, or other label content expressions would evaluate to via runtime without actually seeing the label on screen, I presume? Yeah, so not yet, uh, but we are planning to release an SDK for arcades that um, will allow our developers to directly use arcade in their applications. OK, thanks, Peter. Uh, OK, we've got a uh, slightly more involved question. Um, I have a map service that consists of a single polyline layer. I have the lines labeled with horizontal offset, um, but I can't seem to keep the label placement once I adjust them for certain base maps. The labels end up right in along the line. How to keep horizontal offset placement? Um, OK, it depends exactly what you're trying to achieve or, or what you mean by a horizontal offset. Possibly you mean using the offset X inside the symbol, um, which should still be added on regardless. If you set the placement style, you set the placement position um, using um, the uh, placement property or label placement property in the JSON to the position you want along the line, whether it is centered above or below, um, along or at the ends of the line. On top of that, there are other options for the type of text layout, whether it is straight or following the feature or horizontal. So those should be what you're using to get the particular position and style of labeling. And then using the offset property, you should be able to control how far away the label is from the line geometry. Um, if that doesn't seem to be working, um, then it sounds like it would be a bug. Uh, and I'd advise that you um, use um, your support connections to log a bug with us um, or raise a question with us um, through the uh, geo forum uh, and we'll try and answer and investigate in more detail. Uh, sorry, next question. Canada does not have too many islands. Uh, Chris, I believe this was uh, mentioned in your, your talk. Yeah, I'm not so, sure how um, you want to address that. <laughs> no, uh, so I've incidentally done some more research um, since this question has come in and I am to stand corrected. It's Sweden that has too many islands and Norway has the perfect amount of islands, which therefore Canada has too few islands. So I just want to make the record straight on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and while you're at it, um, could you clarify whether the samples are available to users? Um, yeah, so um, I believe that these samples are not going to be available on GitHub or, or any um, uh, code um, host that we have, but uh, we will be having new samples 
um, for this uh, for this update with documentation as well. So they're probably a bit more useful than than our kind of hacked together ones. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, that's gone straight away being voted up. Can the labels be converted to annotations? Uh, Alex, would you like to uh, answer that one, please? Uh, sure. Um, so within Runtime Core at the moment, we don't have a specific way to convert labels to annotations themselves. Um, my understanding is that the usual workflow is to do that via uh, some tool like Pro. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, uh, but at the moment uh, we only support loading in annotations from other sources. That's correct. At the moment, we're not seeing runtime as uh, an authoring environment for creating um, new annotation content. Um, so we rely on ArcGIS Pro to, to generate the annotations. And a uh, slightly different one. Can the labels in a vector tile layer rotate as the map rotates? Um, OK, this session was primarily about the uh, dynamic labeling content vector tile labeling is slightly different um, it comes in uh, via a different format and gets managed by a different label engine um, my i haven't worked on it recently um, but my i believe uh, vector tile labels do stay with their line features if they're for instance street labels um, and so they will rotate with the line features um, point and polygon labels in vector tiles. Um, I, to be honest, I cannot remember if there is a setting to for them to remote uh, to rotate with their map or not. Um, I'll, if you want me to follow up on that, please get in touch um, on the forum, uh, and I can get you a definitive answer on that, uh, and I'll look it up for my my own use anyway. Uh, moving on, because I'm aware we've got limited time. Um, Peter, uh, support for old style expressions uh, using the square bracket notation, will they always be supported or will they be deprecated at some point? Yeah, um, this type of expression um, is not planned to be deprecated and will be supported in the future. Um, I, just to add on that, I'm not certain that the plus operator will work with this expression. Um, just picking on that a little, but perhaps using the concat arcade function is a slightly better alternative for uh, this expression. But yeah, it will be supported in future. Uh, yeah, just want to avoid any confusion. It's, it is the concat function, uh, but that's not an arcade function. This is a simple expression, not an arcade expression. Sure. Uh, Chris, what's the difference between a text symbol and a label? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the way that we look at it is that a text symbol is kind of like the presentation properties of, of, of your label. So it's your color, your, your font size, your font, that, the font face that you're using, um, and other kind of similar presentation properties. Whereas a label itself has a properties of, of being positional, um, information uh, properties, you know, deconfliction, expressions. And on top of that, it also contains the presentation properties in text symbol. So in short, text symbol is the presentation of, of, of the presentation style of, of, of a label and the label is kind of like everything, the deconfliction and everything else kind of wrapped up into it. I hope that kind of answers your question. Thanks, Chris. Um, does the reference scale work in 3D displays? Alex. Good question. Um, so at the moment for 3D labels, we don't honor the reference scale. Um, if you have the property set, 3D labeling will just ignore it. So there's no, there's no worry if you convert your labels from 2D to 3D that something will go wrong. Um, in, there may be scope to introduce this in the future. Um, if anyone is particularly interested in it, I would strongly advise you to get in touch with us at community.esri.com uh, and let us know. Uh, but the scale ranges themselves, do they work, Alex? If you set a scale range on your label class? Yes, they do. Um, so I touched on it briefly in the video, um, but the scale ranges work slightly differently between 3D and 2D in that in the 2D case, your scale range um, essentially 
determines a distance between uh, your camera position and the map. Whereas in 3D, it's the distance between the camera and each individual label. So each individual label has their own distance value. Okay, thanks. Uh, another 3D one, uh, all grouped together. Uh, can I drape text flat on the ground in 3D? It's a good question. Uh, strictly speaking, no. Um, if you set surface placement for your layer to be one of the draped options, um, you will always get the same behavior, which is that your label will be dragged to the ground surface, so it will always be flat on the ground. Um, but the text itself will be facing the screen. Uh, it's a mode that we call billboarded. Um, if I remember rightly, there are two options for draped text, billboarded and flat, um, but they'll both do the same thing at the moment. Uh, again, there's future scope for flat text that's actually laid out flat um, to be introduced. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, uh, last one for 3D for a while. What is the recommended way to deal with label overlaps in the 3D? Uh, when, for instance, when you're looking at a shallow angle to the ground, lots of the labels could all be in in the way of each other. Yes. Yeah, so um, certainly from 100.10, um, if labels overlap, they should deconflict. Um, so I would say to that user that if they're seeing that not happen. Um, please do get in touch with us again at community.esri.com uh, and please raise a bug for it and we'll get on it. Thanks. Um, we've got a question about performance. Um, are there any performance considerations related to labeling? And I can see we've got a, a related question a bit lower down on the performance question. Um, someone has commented that they've found that labeling the map um, with deconfliction turn to dynamic is faster than being set to none when working with a lot of densely labeled points. Uh, Chris, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, well, that's, a, that's another great question. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I would argue that there aren't that many performance concerns um, with the labeling um, engines that we have uh, compared with the actual displaying of the um, graphics themselves. Um, I, I, yeah, uh, that's a great question. I'm stumped, but that's as far as I could probably go with it, um, unless any of you could possibly elaborate. Uh, is it possible that with the situation there where you're using dynamic labeling, because that means it is deconflicting and will be dropping some labels, it'll it'll basically be not drawing them. So it sounds like the label engine is faster at deconflicting than the drawing is at drawing the text. And hence the deconflicted labeling when you're using the dynamic deconfliction and even faster static deconfliction. Um, is a lot faster than putting all the labels on the screen when they will all overlap each other is, is my guess as to what's happening there yeah um, I, so I would sorry yeah i would also argue the, the same way particularly if you've got thousands of densely labeled points so yeah i would say that there's not much performance concern with the labeling engine compared to the actual rendering of the information thanks chris um, we've had a couple of questions about the release date um, for 100.11. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the official release dates to hand. Uh, I, I know what our internal development timetables are like, um, but I don't have the date uh, when the product will actually be available to users, uh, unfortunately. Um, that should be available elsewhere in the conference, hopefully in some of the more overview presentations. Um, the, have we already covered the difference between labels and annotations? Alex, did you already cover that one? Um, I covered briefly that we don't author annotations within Runtime Core, um, but strictly speaking, the difference between the labels and annotations is that um, we consider annotations to be um, text that is more static, so it doesn't really move. It doesn't deconflict with each other, um, whereas labels are a bit more fluid in that they can be repositioned uh, in 3D in particular, depending on how you're looking at them. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in with any other differences, but strictly speaking, it's static text versus more dynamic text. Yeah. I think so, oh, sorry, go, go ahead, uh, Nita. 
what I wanted to add is um, the annotation is a piece of text that sort of stores its display properties, location, and text. And annotation comes, uh, for example, in a Geo database, and it's stored um, in a, kind of like in a separate field. Well, labeling is something that we generate on the fly, and a lab label is actually could be generated from 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 a features property. So this is kind of like the main uh, standoff, I believe, between annotation and um, and labels. Okay, thank you. Um, got a question about whether you can use both 2D and 3D labeling at the same time. Uh, I presume this is when you maybe had two different windows that you've opened in your application, one showing a scene, one showing a, a map view, um, but they're both using the same data source with the same label definitions. Um, Peter, I don't know if you've developed uh, a sample like that recently. Um, actually, yes and no. So I did recently encounter uh, a WPF .NET application that was displaying a map view and a scene view side by side. So um, I was actually also using labeling. So yes, 2D and 3D labeling in the same application is possible. However, the only kind of like um, question that remains is whether you will be able to use the same data source or uh, something, uh, something which I wouldn't be able to confirm. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, I believe um, from, from the technical architecture point of view, there's no reason why the two of them shouldn't um, work at the same time simultaneously from the same source. All the events should still fire and both should update uh, and they'll both use the same label class definitions. And um, already answered that one. <laughs> what time is it here? Uh, it is currently uh, quarter to 10 in the evening. Um, the text team, both for Runtime and for ArcGIS Pro uh, are all based in the Cardiff R&D office in Wales, in the UK. Uh, so yes, yeah, it's, it's a later day than usual for us here. Uh, and which section should we reach out to for more questions? Um, there is um, an, uh, the Ask the Experts um, area for the whole conference, uh, within which there is an ArcGIS Runtime uh, desk or channel. Uh, I believe certainly Rex and Nick Finesse, Rex Hansen and Nick Finesse are there a lot of the time. Um, otherwise, uh, our other colleagues will be there and they should be able to uh, answer a lot of your um, questions uh, or be able to um, get us in touch with you or put you in touch with us uh, and direct you to um, any of the online channels. Uh, see, we're close on time so just want to remind people if they've got further questions at any time um, in the future or want to follow up on anything that we've discussed here today um, if you go to community.esri.com and look for the developers section and look for the native libraries section within that that will cover all of runtime um, and we will be we always monitor that for anything to do with labeling annotation text um, arcade uh, and do our best to uh, respond or if you've got uh, and you, you, can, you can post sort of examples in there give us information on the precise problem you've got um, or if you know or suspect you you've got a, to found a bug in the software um, then please um, log a support call um, and it'll come through and we'll work on that similarly if there are any areas in text that you see as a priority that we don't support currently, um, we'd be very interested in hearing. Um, we do have planned features for the next few releases, um, but um, we're always interested in what is going to provide the most value and use for our users. So we're always keen to hear, and make your vote be heard. Um, hopefully that's been useful. Um, we'll follow up on any unanswered questions uh, afterwards. Please continue to reach out to us. Um, other than that, thank you very much uh, and good night or good day.